As you can see from the rest of my channel, I'm a huge fan of Wendaya. This might even be my favorite band. However, when I discovered the band, there was little to know about them, and like many black metal bands, it stayed on a rather underground level that wouldn't allow most people to get a gasp of the history of the band. So I started digging, and I eventually stumbled upon many things. The only problem was that most things that I found were really dispatched on the internet and it was really hard for the casual listener to uh, take its time to find everything. That's why I decided to make this video. I do think that despite the popularity of the band among the black metal community, this band should get much more credit for all what it has brought. Just a little warning. This video will heavily focus on the life of Terje Bakken, who was the sinking mind of the band. Also, I know that some people will be skeptical about my video, and I totally understand. So, I will put the sources in the description if you want to check them. So here it is, the true story of Wendaya. It all begins in 1978 with the birth of Terje Bakken in Sogenda, Norway. Sogenda in itself is not really a town, it's a commune. Uh, by the way, sorry for my accent, I'm not Norwegian. So a commune is a gathering of small villages under centralized authority. It seems like a detail, but it's actually really important to get what Windyre is, despite being a small commune. Sogendal still has its own cultural identity, its own language, Sogendal, its own myth, and of course, its own history. Terry grew up in the countryside and according to himself, he felt physically ill near a city. He started listening to music at the age of 4 or 5 and listened to artists like Haba or Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, he liked the uh, sad atmosphere of the songs. This was the fuel of his imagination, sadness, but we'll come to that later. He was first introduced to heavy metal by his siblings when he was 10 or 11, mostly famous bands like Judas Priest or Metallica, but soon he turned to more extreme stuff, death metal. At that time, he also started to get interested in more than just listening. He started learning accordion and guitar, and according to him, he didn't start to add new instruments. He also studied music on a composing side with bands like Pestilians, but he was always in search of this extreme and sad music lacking in his life. And luckily for him, growing up as a teenager in Norway in the 90s was basically the best thing if you wanted to hear a dark and extreme music. When black metal began being a thing in Norway, music became really a central part of Wolfhard's life. He spent his time studying what came out, bands like Burtzum, Dark Throne or Emperor. These were basically his favorite bands. This is why we found so many influences of early 90s black metal bands in his music. He tried to understand how to make something like that but different. At first he struggled and its first song were basically ripoffs of well-known songs from bands he liked. He was also helping some friends by playing on live, mostly bass and guitar. The idea to mix folk music to metal was for him an evidence, uh, as he played black metal on one hand and polka on the other. And because he considered that the two genres had the same atmosphere, he decided to mix them. For him, harmonics and melodies were the most important parts of music. He wanted to create a sensation of bliss by his own words. He started composing music using a music track and sequencer named Fast Tracker. It was at the time mostly used for electronic music and these are influences that we find all around the rest of his career. With all that, he composed his first two demos under the name Valfa, demos which are Sogner Ricketts and Ned Ricketts in 1994 and 1995. When Dyer, which means uh, Primitive Warrior and Sognaval, which is the language of his region, was born. At the time, his friends started the band Hulkus More, which was more of a thrash metal band rather than a black metal band. The two demos were really raw and with lo-fi production, and according to himself, 
it was mostly crap, but at least it helped him understand what he wanted to do and where he wanted to go with his music. It was the birth of what he will later call Sogna Metal. Stan Grimm and Stan Arson were the drummer and the one doing clean vocals on the demos, so when Dyer can't really be seen as a one-man band, despite what many claims, his way of composing was pretty strange. As said before, he liked sad songs and could only compose in this state of mind. He started to drink a lot and use all the type of toxins, as I say, I don't really know what it is. It increased his feelings and mostly sadness, which helped him a lot to compose his first album. At the same time, he contacted the label he had not found to release this album and he got a positive response. He wanted to work with them mostly to avoid any kind of language barrier as the label was Norwegian. In April of 1997 was released the first album, Sognada, I don't really know how to pronounce it. It was pretty well received, but it is generally said that it's his worst album. I think it's because Stereobarken had not found his true way of composing. The album was already really atmospheric and full of melodies, but some things were off. The vocals were not as strong as the rest of his albums. It was sometimes repetitive. Don't get me wrong, the album was correct by all standards, but it was not a masterpiece. It could have ended here. If it was not for the will of Valfa, he came back to composing a lot with the idea of going even more into folk. He started drinking more and more. He was even making his own moonshine named Thunder, which was a mix between water, uh, sugar and yeast. It created some kind of wine that according to him slowly turned him crazy because of how much alcohol there was in it. He even got into jail a few times because of his drunkness and sometimes violent behaviors while drunk. It was already a bad time for him and he admitted afterwards that if the next album had not been as successful he would probably have killed himself. An important thing to know about Terry Bacon was that despite being a fan of the Norwegian black metal scene, he still preferred well-produced music and said himself that he hated how many black metal bands would make raw music just to make raw music. This time he wanted to put more effort to the production of the album. This album was partly recorded in Sogendal with Stan Grimm and Stan Arsen, but mostly in the famous Grigalan studio. It may not ring a bell for you, but if you are watching this video, you most likely have listened to at least one album coming out of it. Legendary bands like Mayhem, Bootsum or Emperor all recorded most of the albums here. It was hard for Terry Bakken to have to travel to the city, which made him less comfortable with recording, but at least he could have the best quality to uh, record such music. According to him, this album was a peak of his career, and I have to agree with that. Anton and Vindar is a piece of art in many ways. Each song have their own atmosphere and they are all good in their ways. It's honestly hard for me to find real flaws in this album. The entire touch was finally born. I know that there is a controversy around the use of a World War II propaganda poster as the album cover. It was an accident. The image was in a book without the mention of its original purpose and was chosen because he liked it. There have been some questionable lyrics in his first demos, but it sounds more edgy than Nazi. Actually, we don't know much about uh, Terry Bakken political ideas and it's a bit hard to have a clear idea of what they are despite the number of, of questions he got about this subject. If we stick to the facts, we can say that Terry Bakken didn't really like communism and capitalism. He put the emphasis on honor uh, as value, not in a martial way, he was even in favor of reducing armies and armaments, but honor as a series of moral values. He didn't really see a problem with nationalism or things like that, as long as it was not really a uh, Nazi related ideologies, you know. But he himself found many problems with Norwegian society uh, and could sometimes be afraid of the impact of globalism on Norway's economy. But overall, he was not close to every changes in societies. I don't want to go deeper into it because nobody really cared about his political ideas, it was just a, a statement. This album is about Hartol, a peasant who started a rebellion against uh, the new king of Norway, Sverre I, in 
element 83. I will not go into details, but this part of history is really important uh, for Segundar and Terry Bakken. Uh, he made a lot of research about the subjects and even found out that Hantor was the direct ancestor of uh, Lol. Uh, one of his friends who was the basis of Hawkus, a band that went from thrash to black metal. After this album, he couldn't get himself to compose again. It was really hard because the success of his last album, which sold at about 6,000 copies, gave him a lot of pressure and he was not really well seen in Sogendal for his use of local history and association with black metal, uh, which was not really well seen in Norway at that time. He needed something else than alcohol this time. That's how he got the idea to work with Vol and the members of Orcus. He was the main composer and ultimately he was the one who chose the direction of the albums, but he dreamed big and wanted to try to reach the quality of the last album and his ideas could only be made with the exterior help. Vol had a more aggressive way of composing and this is what characterized this album. It took two years to compose it, just like the previous albums. They went on June of 2001 to the uh, Akir Augen studio to record it. The pressure was hard for him because everyone had been waiting for this album to come out and this is when he did the most of his interviews. He wanted to create something unprecedented in black metal, something that will push the genre further. He didn't really like the cringy vibes of some of the old bands and said himself that he didn't want to be associated with church burnings or crimes and hope that black metal would be accepted in the more mainstream scene one day. That's why, despite the fact that the album was much more aggressive, he still tried to make it more accessible by writing lyrics in English and German, but also by implementing electro elements. Element 84 would be its name to continue the story of Antor. This album talks about the battle of Fimerates and the death of Antor in the battle. It's for me a magnificent album, really aggressive and with many catchy riffs. The goal was to reach the level of uh, Antor and Windyre and for many it topped it. And the final song of the album, A Journey to the End, promised a new era for Windyre with more experimentations. Also, talking about this song, I saw many people saying that it may have been some kind of suicide letter. It was not. He said in an interview that he just liked to talk about dying in general and it had no meaning beyond that. We don't know much about what happened between 1184 and his next album. According to Terry Bakken himself, his life was going better. He had not been really active in the past few years, but he started working at his farm. He loved his tractor and he talked a lot about it and was going to become a guitar teacher. At this point, only his porn addiction remained. He always talked about porn in his interviews. He did a lot of shows with his band where he was, according to Val, completely drunk and started composing his fourth album about Hantor Legacy. The composition process was much simpler with Vol and the band, and so they went to the same studio to record the album titled Lakeford. A Lakeford is a tradition in Sogendal and pretty much in the Westlanders region where people were transported in a burial ship across their town or village. It was mainly for rich and noble people. This album was made to be the darkest and most aggressive album according to Vol. And when it came out in 2003, it was extremely well received. The atmosphere of the songs were just perfect and the inclusion of many classical elements made the music even more interesting than before. After the release of the album, they went on tour in the US and made shows in Norway too. Valfar was at the peak of his career with three successful albums, a job, a band he called Lion, and a growing passion for music. Everything had to go alright. He found it. On the 14th of January 2004, Terry Bakken was going to his family cabin in the mountains. It was a pretty long walk, but he could manage to do it. On his way to the family cabin, the wind started to rise and soon a snowstorm was coming in the mountains. He could not have predicted it, but now it was too late. Not much is known from there and I prefer not to speculate or elaborate by respect for him and his family. But after not seeing him arrive to the cabin, his family decided to call the police and after the snowstorm ended, they went to search him. Two days after the incident, he was found dead from hypothermia. 
This was the end of Alpha and therefore the end of Windwire. His band decided to make a last charity concert with Terrius Brother, as well as a compilation album with a recording of the concerts as well as covers from bands like Finchroll or Enslaved and also songs that were supposed to be on the next album. Today, a gravestone commemorates him in Solimdal with the inscription Sagne e Endelost, which means the longing or the sorrow is eternal. After his death, many bands started to affiliate their music with Windyre under the Sogna Metal genre, and I highly recommend you to check them because most of these bands are really awesome. Windyre has been my favorite band for years now, and it has, in my opinion, changed many things in the black metal scene. Windyre's music was unique and Balfour knew it. He called it a kind of atmospheric, epic, viking metal, and the only band he compared Windyre to was uh, Old Man's Child. But despite that, it seems that the band has been forgotten the past few years, as if its contribution was not really important. It took me a lot of time to find information about it, and I believe that despite the fact that I didn't go deep into his life in my video, it is still one of the most complete biography, and I hope that the band will be more known by the metal community. By the way, I might continue to talk about bands that I really like, but it might take a lot of time because this kind of video takes time, so bye for now.